just to answer one of the things from Mong Hoi Tan, um, I do apologise, I didn't see the chat thing, so yes, I was going a bit fast, and I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't see the chat before, but I will, as Dom suggested, go through things again, but I haven't covered where to find files just yet, so don't worry about that, that hasn't come up yet. If you're there, because I'm not sure who's there, because you might actually be on a break, but I'll go through things again. Um, Zoe, I think it was things like start a file as in um, start a script rather than um, find files on your own PC. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So start, yeah. It's all new terminology, isn't it? So it's all very confusing. There's so many people here as well, that's quite tricky. This is a lot more useful than the sort of training that somebody tried to deliver to us before because it's explaining more about the structure of the program in a bit more detail. So it is useful for the uh, Surrey Hartman stuff to say. Yeah, this first bit does take a bit longer. I think the thing is because. I missed the feedback from the chat, so that's my fault for not knowing where the bits are. But different people find different bits at stages. Yeah. So when I did it last week, um, this bit was the, the longest part, obviously, because you're getting started, getting it up and running, and then it got a bit faster as things were going. But I started off with very fast, so I do apologise. Well, I managed to do the whole thing about creating a new project. That means that everything defaults that you're saving in that place that you're creating. Your speaker's a bit, uh, I don't know if it's just the speakers, I didn't really quite catch that, sorry. Uh, sort of um, just so you know. Sound. Oh, I can hear. <laughs> yeah, just so you know that I, I, I keep hearing that from you, and I don't know if everybody else is, but you keep going very, very quiet and then it comes back in again. Ooh, okay. So I don't know if that's. Just my own. Maybe I should, uh, if I'm turning away from my, maybe that makes it worse as well. Is that better? <laughs> then we get really big. Is that hit? A, Can you hear that? I think okay? it's in, internet. I think it's not the sound as sound. It's oh, like okay. physical sound. I think it's the internet because it's yeah. a bit laggy. But to be honest, I have slight uh, worry that it might be because you are in the cloud or in the cloud is very consuming because of the internet. I don't know. Uh, oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, my internet can be a bit anyway. patchy. That's, <laughs> uh, that's the other thing. Internet can be a bit patchy, and mine is. Just cut that some of the end. So, what I was saying is that um, I've created, I followed what you said, and because I'm using the desktop one, and it is useful to be able to do what you say to have created a, um, a project. Successfully, so that, that's where it's good. That's a dog. The, the squeaking is a dog, not me. It's not a dog until you show us your dog. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if it was a dog or a child, because it could have been either. Oh, oh, what a lovely dog. <laughs> like, what's going on? I was playing with my toy and now I'm getting a cuddle. It's when cats come along, they always want to sit on the laptop because it's nice and warm. Yeah, <laughs> and they and, always and take in, over. In front of the screen as well. Yeah. Chris had that um, in the uh, Our Medicine Global Conference, didn't he? Did we? Oh, who was that? Chris. No, I missed it. Was it oh, Chris's was. cat? Yeah. <laughs> well, Chris's cat actually sat on the camera once when I was on a call to him. It was hilarious. He just went black because it was all cat. <laughs> he hadn't switched off his, his camera. Yeah, they still were seen though, don't they? Oh yeah, everybody was commenting on it. I remember now. Right, it's half past. I guess people will be streaming back. Um, I'll just start by recapping and hoping that people are here. Maybe do a show of hands of, if you're there.
Give me a show of hands. Oh, some people have got different hands. I've got little hand, little blue hands, and I've got that gets counted, and the other ones don't. I wonder what that is about. That's clapping, I suppose. Is that something else? Well, the blue one is raised hand, um, and obviously yeah. thumb up and clapping is reactions. So it's just different ways to draw your attention. So yes, cool. Got more people over there, so I'm not seeing. And, and Jane, okay. Jane is here as well, but she still can't find your hand. Okay. Right, I will recap. So, I missed the chats for people who haven't heard in the kind of like the break that we had. I didn't see the chat, so I was going a bit fast. So I'm just going to recap things, which is always good anyway when you're learning. And as I suggested as well, going through the presentation slides in your own time can be quite helpful. That I'm using them to deliver the course, so they're quite straightforward. There's a lot of stuff in there to follow. They're not presentation slides that rely on much of the present presenter giving the details separately to it. It's a really good training manual in itself. So when I started off, um, I explained the difference and the similarities between R and R Studio. And some people came in later as well. So you even miss that bit. So the, the key part of that is that R and R Studio need to work together. R Studio is on top of R. And after a while, like I do, I forget that there's even something called R and you kind of interchangeably use the two things. So I'll just get through those because this was the bit that I think people got lost on because I was going too quickly. Um, there are four parts to your screen on R Studio. The bit that you'll use the most is this editor part, but we started off by using the console. Everything eventually goes to the console. Oh, look, my um, studio so cloud is take, reloading. Can you take one step back actually and get go from going to like a empty desktop to the cloud and the desktop version? Uh, so people haven't got to the cloud yet? Um, I, I, just, just in case. Okay. So, um, the course was designed originally for being um, so real time kind of thing. So it face to face. So we're using a lot of the cloud based things so that we have the same uh, access to stuff, whereas you don't necessarily have that on a computer. So uh, in the chat, and you can ask for it again, we went to the cloud itself. So you click on a project in the cloud called NHSR Community Conference. Mine's really slow, so I do apologize. It's just ticking along. If you click on intro R, you'll get a new project. This is kind of a new way of working in the cloud. Uh, it's something that NHSR are using more and more. I can see now I've got messages. So they're using that more frequently so that we all have the same thing. There is a command to clean the console. I've tried clean, but no success. No, what you can do, <laughs> the kind of skipping between things, sorry. So if I just run through things and then tell you how to clean it, are you trying to start from the beginning? Right, this is very confusing. Um, two ways of cleaning your screen. In the cloud, go to session and then restart R. And it will restart everything. It will clear all your loaded packages and it will clear all of your um, global environment, anything that you've installed and things. So it's all gone, it's all tidy. Mine hasn't changed much because I haven't saved these things. So it's just cleared the stuff that you can't see. Is everybody, let's do it the other way around. Is there anybody who is not on the cloud or on our studio, on their computer and able to follow along? Any hands? Okay, I'm not um, seeing any hands. Yeah, I, I, I've... Oh, like, sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I, I've been installing it uh, on my desktop just during this thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. And when I installed dot .package quote tidyverse, uh, it started to do it, but it comes up at the top saying, um, warning, our tools is required to build our packages, but is not currently installed. Please download and install the appropriate version of our tools before proceeding. Um, right. But then after that, 
it's downloaded and installed uh, a load of things which have been successfully unpacked and MD5 sums checked. Uh, okay. So should people get this uh, tools thing for our Not studio? normally, no. No, okay. not normally. And I think this is what I sort of referred to before in that different people have got different restrictions or they've got different levels of equipment availability. Oh, this and is all my own, de yeah. own desktop with no... Yeah. Permission. So you shouldn't get any messages like that. But sometimes if it's missing something and it says this is not installed, I've had to install packages and do that particular thing that it's telling me to do. Yeah. So it may be that you need to do install packages, our tools or something like that to try and patch it up in a sense. But it does sound like it's running. So if you do library, brackets, tidyverse, then that might be OK. It might give you some other warning. Cheers. I'll, OK. I'm just checking that now. Right, so there are four quadrants in the R Studio. You'll always use the console, even if you're not typing into it. Because if you type to the editor, it sends it to the console. So when you write something and run it, which I'm doing in control enter on the first line, it appears down in the console as running. Uh, sort of mentioned before that you get these messages. They're not errors. They're just telling you that there are conflicts. So filter is used in one package. It's also used in another. And it's just giving you a warning that they might clash. To get a new script, which is how they're referred to in RStudio, there are three ways of doing it. There's the shortcut key, which will work on your desktop, but it won't work on your cloud because you're using Explorer or Chrome or some other web browser. There's a cross on a tiny kind of like page in the top left hand side, which says new file, R script. And there's also file, new file, R script. That's not to get data into the system, that's just to open a new script for R to run, to do things to things. Control enter is a very useful um, shortcut key. I use lots of shortcut keys and there are various within R Studio. And actually, I didn't mention this before, but there is keyboard shortcut help in tools. And there are several of them. So have a look through there. You can set your own as well. So if there's something that you particularly like, it has that flexibility that you have in Microsoft, which you can do it there. Too. You can write comments in your code, which I've done here. So it doesn't run that code. That's a hashtag. That's very, very useful. And you can change your RStudio tool setup to make it more comfortable, which is why mine's a black screen with some white text. And you can change the size of the letters and things. I'll skip through that though. Packages, just to refresh. This is the kind of the trouble that we had before when we were doing library tidyverse. You need to have it installed on your computer, much like you would with an app on a mobile phone so that you can call it later. If you haven't got it installed, you're not opening something that's already there. So the computer will get confused and say, no, I don't have that. package." And also when you're trying to run something, you must always load it. So if you shut it down and move away or pass your script to somebody else, you need to load it each time you run a script. There are thousands of packages. There'll be something out there for everybody. Packages are visualizations and charts, graphs. Oh, that's the same thing, sorry. Um, maps. There's statistical programs and there are language programs and you can produce presentation slides even in this. And you can just use it as a calculator, which is what we did at the very, very beginning when we did Python 2. We're using Tidyverse today, which is a package of packages which has various things in it. And I don't think I've even used all the packages in it. We also ran through projects which were incredibly important, a bit complicated because we were using the cloud for the majority of the people. So you don't, this is a project in itself. Whereas if I look at my own desktop in the top right hand corner, I have a list of projects that I've already created and I can create new ones. And I recommend that because it gets around working directory problems if you're on a network and you have different pathway formats. It gives you the details down here in this bottom quadrant of what's in that folder and you can open things from there, which we will do in a second. And it reduces your cognitive load because it's, it's very easy to use. You can switch between them really easily. It means that you don't have uh, issues when you share your code with somebody else because it makes it neater rather than referring to something in a C drive that only you have access to, that other person will not have that 
code in their script to stop it from running. You can share projects as well, or you can set up your new project. There's an addendum to this, and I missed this before. I think we, we referred to that one, actually. So we're going to importing data. So I ran through that as a, a refresh because some people were following and some people weren't. Hands up if anybody needs any more help on any bit or comments. And I'm going to just flash to the chat. Toolbars is really helpful. Yes, there's a lot in our studio that I didn't use for a long time and keeps cropping up and think, oh, that's really useful. Few people have got in problems with packages and can try and sort those out maybe to a later stage, but this is a common issue with getting it onto your computer. It's as if you're installing Microsoft Excel. It's not actually that straightforward sometimes. It is for some people, not for others. Some people use Linux, some people use Windows. We've got all those differences as well. So importing data. So it's one thing to use R in its current form, but we always want to get data in there. And this is a really crucial part of doing stuff in R. Um, there are packages to import data. Some of them are fixed in Tidyverse, I think. There might be a particular package to read data. You can actually read things from SPSS or Stata, MATLAB, um, even from Python, there'll be packages to install and import data from other sources. Even SQL, you can do SQL connections as well from R to grab your data off a SQL server, which I use quite a lot. And I think there is, well, I know there's a webinar that's on the NHSR community website. All the webinars are pre-recorded as well, or recorded and available to watch. One of them from Chris Maney was about importing data using database connections. And I'd recommend watching that because there are several packages for SQL. The common imports, particularly when you first start, are CSV and Excel. So what we want to import is capacity ae.csv file. Now I'm sure I put a message somewhere to myself, but maybe I didn't. As I sort of referred before, this course is supposed to be over a day, but we're only going to do this for so like half a day up till two o'clock. So what this course normally starts off with is a ggplot2, which is the data visualization bit, but I'm going to switch it round. But part of the ggplot2 is an import of a very basic file. Oh, I'm doing it the wrong way around, that's why. It's capacity AE CSV, sorry. So this is just a straightforward import. You don't do anything to the data, you just bring it straight in. So in the bottom quadrant of your, I'm on the cloud here, you need to have library tidyverse running, I think, or maybe you don't actually, you don't, sorry, I'm trying to think ahead. If you scroll down to, we're looking for capacity a underscore ae.csv in the bottom quadrant of the files to import and I'm doing this on the cloud. A lot of people are on the cloud. It should follow the same on your desktop as well. You, as it says here, you could write code to do this, but there's a, a visual use bit here, a visual sort of like GUI friendly wizard is the word I'm looking for. There are two ways actually, I forgot about this one. You can import the data set using this button up here, as it says on the presentation slide. As I said before, actually, it's very much like Microsoft. If there's one way of doing something, there's actually three or four, and I did forget that one. So you can import your data set. You need to know what it is. And these are just the examples that it has here. And as I said before, you have other data that you can import just because they're here. Not here doesn't mean that it can't be done. It's just that these are the most common, I suspect. We're going to look for text reader, which is the basic one for CSV files. It takes a bit of time to load the screen, but you get a, an import wizard screen, which is on the presentation slide. You can locate the file using the browse, and it gives you all the options there. So you can then click on capacity AE CSV and then open. So your sound's dropped out again. I went quiet. So when did I stop? Uh, um, I'll go through that again. Just about like, uh, 
at browse. Sorry, now browse, and then okay. it just gets a little bit of a wibble, which I assume is some bandwidth thing or something. Yeah, probably. So I went to browse and you can see all the files that you can see down here in that section in the folder. Scroll down to capacity aee.csv and then open. It'll do it again on mine, but it's already done. So it's just, it's just going to overlay. Show of hands for anybody who's not at that screen. Okay, brilliant. There's at least oh, one person Chris. on the chat who it isn't on that screen. Okay. Oh, reconnect. I've got a few people. Okay, so I'm going to start again. So hopefully as people are loading. Yeah. So as people are yeah. I just want to suggest to people who can't see the list. Uh, I can say email from Chris. If you can't see the list of files, can you send us some kind of screenshot in the chat so you can see what you can see? Um, but you, Zoe, Zoe Creon, I'll try to deal with the uh, Chris now. So what I did to start from the beginning was I went to import data set here, which is in the top right hand quadrant. I went to text read r dot dot dot. I then had to look for some data because it's not seeing anything. To browse dot dot. And because I'm on the cloud and I'm in that folder and it's a project, it sees all these folders, all these files, sorry. And then I selected capacity ae.csv and then open. Um, so I was thinking that people who might have tried starting a new package might um, not be able to see the files. Start a new package, so I don't understand. Oh, sorry, start a new uh, project. Uh, so they've started it with nothing in it at all. Oh, okay. Um, no, no, if they, if they, they, they followed your instructions to like, because we talk about how useful projects were, if they've created a new project at that point, they want to see all the files without switching back. If you selected, uh, if I take it back, sorry. If you, if you're on the cloud and started a new project. Sorry, I was just- It's a bit difficult if you're on the desktop, yeah. Uh, if you mean, if you go back to the RStudio where you just were then, and you had the untitled one and untitled two in the top left as the new script. And yes. perhaps they were working off a new one of them rather than the old, but I, I don't know if that would have an impact. No, I think if you're on the cloud and you click on intro underscore R, it'll open up a new project, but it will be based on that project. So you should see all of the files. If you do something else where you create a new project not related to any of those, you've not clicked on a link, it will be blank because you have to upload everything. So the cloud is like a new folder structure. So you have to get everything into it for it to work. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm good. I, I, I've session. got it open. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just if you don't have it open, go and open intro to R underscore thing. Okay. Yes. If you click on that, then it will create a new project but with all of those files and if you don't have any of those files I suspect it's a new project altogether and won't have anything in it. Somebody's got an error crashing when importing the data set. I've just crashed mine actually when I tried to do it so I'll just do that again so I did import data set read r browse I'll just see if it works on mine that's the AE open import well no actually what we need to do before that we say does it look reasonable is everybody okay there's a few people getting errors so is it possible if you're on a desktop version to get yep. to the bit you're talking about so on a desktop if you've got the files in the same folder that you're looking at or if you have them saved somewhere that you can find you're doing the same thing. So I would do import data from Radar. This is my desktop browse. And this is what I can see in my folder, but I can navigate to downloads if it's there. Yeah, you just have to have it on your computer. 
Um, Which is should a be bit able to navi to do. navigate to the web URL, I think. On. The capacity.ae something. On the cloud or on your desktop? On Git. If they, they oh, somebody that. just said that they were having problems and restarted the project and now it's working fine. So I think that we're, because we're all on the, I'm, I'm assuming, because I don't really know the cloud, we might just be hammering it a little bit and it's not working too well. So if I just say everybody's here at this preview bit, is every, hands up if you're not on the preview. So when we look at this, it's not too bad. It looks okay. We've got the dimensions it says here and the column names. That, so you get a preview of your import, which is useful. You don't get all the, I don't think you get all the lines. Or maybe you do. You get 50, it says there. I think there are a few more actually. But you don't nest, you can do import at the bottom. It says we don't want to do this on this occasion because the suggestion is, and this is really useful, is to copy the text that it gets here. So this is your script that you would type out, but you don't have to does it for you. So you can both import and you can copy this for future script writing. The thing about R and R Studio and the R packages that we use, they're very script based. R Studio is useful to use because you can click and drop and move things around and it's very friendly, but writing it as a script means that you can just rerun it without having to do those clicks. If you remove your clicks, you remove your potential for error. So what I'm going to do is copy library and read R and the capacity AE and just copy using control C as usual. If you're familiar with the keyboard shortcuts, I think you can right click on it and copy as well. And now we can cancel. So you can import it, but I'm going to cancel it just to show that you can then paste it into your editor. It, I've copied the library that it uses, but I think that library is also in tidyverse. And then you can run it with control enter. And then you get something appearing in this top right hand quadrant. Is everybody okay with that? Hands up if you're not. I, I'm not. Um... But then it told me it crashed, so I'll just refresh yeah, I think, our studio. Yeah. And so just to remind everybody, if you go to tools, you can refresh, oh, not tools, sorry, session, forgot it, and restart R. And you can do that on the cloud and on the desktop, and that will refresh everything and start again. That may help, or it may be that you need to come out and go back in again, because a few people have had those problems. Any hands up for more issues? Uh, when we come back in, would we have to re-import the data set? No, not if you're on the cloud, it should be there already. Your, your project should still be available for you to use. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. Unfortunately, it crashed again. And I was oh. hoping that that was because I hadn't uh, re-imported the data set. I'll, I'll shut it down and then try again. Okay. Darren, you got your hand up? Yeah, I still I just still didn't follow what you were saying about the um, when you're on the desktop to try and navigate to where you need oh. to find that data set. Have you saved all your files somewhere? Um, what do you mean by save my have files? You, have you got any files at all from the GitHub repository? I haven't covered any of that, so I suspect you haven't got those at all. No. Um, nice. So if I just refer so in, you to in the chat, yeah. I've um, uh, put how they get the file just directly from GitHub. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, so that might not be useful in the future, but it is. It is a, a snippet there. Is it a bit? You might need to just redo it again so that it can be seen, because I think it was quite early on. Darren, there we go. So those are the files are on GitHub, so they're available, but you might need some help getting them, I'm not sure. 
um, that line should just grab the um uh, oh okay yeah you got the this. actual CSV. oh right so yes i've just realized so the read at csv comment is actually reading directly from the web to get the file that you require which is a nifty way of getting it directly without having to download it save it and then refer to it that's the other good thing about our scripts is that you can scrape things from the web and that's that's kind of a scrape thing where you're getting the file itself so uh you said you've got online what should i do next where are you mong hoi tan when you say i typed in library tidy tidy first are you okay helping um, I'm not too sure where that one is, so I'm going to keep everybody going on with the import wizard. Okay, yeah. Um, so we've I can help. Thank you. So we've installed the file capacity AE, and just to view it, you could see that in the code when you're importing it, but one, if you click on the object, as it's now referred to in that top right-hand corner, you can see some of the detail in it. You can see the entire file, actually. So it goes down to... 68 lines, you can see here it's got 68 observations, five variables means five columns. And that's the data set that you imported and that's what you can see. So if you open the CSV file, it would look like that. What I would now normally do is go through ggplot2 and do grass, but I'm going to go to dplyr because one of the things you'll always need to do is get your data into a reasonable shape before you do anything to it. So by that, I mean tidying it up, cleaning it. It's not always perfect. It doesn't always come in a nice, neat way. And we have various things we need to do with our data as we get them in. And it's, it's kind of fundamental to do anything else within R. So it's, to, it's called manipulation or engineering or wrangling even, particularly in the R community. And it means reshaping or transforming your data, tidying up, doing some counts, adding some things to it, moving your columns about, quite a lot of stuff that's familiar in Excel when you're just moving things around with your mouse and clicking and things, or in SQL when you're writing your code out to, say, to do bits and pieces with it. You can do a little bit more with R than you can in SQL. It's just, it's a bit quicker because it's, it's a statistical package, so you can add things to it like means and medians, which is a bit harder in SQL if you're going to do that. So you always need to get your data, you need, always need to look at your data, you always need to tweak it somehow, it's never perfect before you work with it. And it's referred a lot in the community as tidy data. And it's based on the principles of SQL. And what I never realized before was that I've been doing a lot of the tidy formats before in SQL, but I never knew the, the terms. Hadley Wickham has written about this and sort of formalized it within the R community, I feel, where he's called them um, tidy data. So every variable has a column and every observation has a row. I think it's, it's a bit, the way I would view it, uh, try and explain it, um, I think there are some charts and things and there's some, you can Google this, but tidy data specifically. But when I've worked with data myself, when I've produced things in Excel for people to view, I tend to need to have things in a human viewed format. So you see this with ONS data more than say, um, maybe public health data even, when you get it from the internet, you have one row for one person say, or one local authority, and then column after column after column of information. That's human friendly, but not machine readable or data readable. So if you're familiar with SQL tables, they don't have one row for each patient and columns relating to the data to that patient, you have your patient repeated often with their details next to them. So they may have contacts and you have three or four rather than contact one, contact two, contact three, contact four. Tidy data is like the SQL formula where you've got multiple rows for patients with data across, down, sorry, so long data rather than wide data, which is how we sometimes have to change our data to make it people friendly. And to get a lot of the data into a machine readable format or a way to use it to do statistical things with it or to put it into charts, we use a package called dplyr, which appears in the tidyverse um, package of package. There are lots of, as they call them, verbs, they're functions as well, 
There are quite a few in dplyr, but we're going to go through five of them, which you can do quite a lot with just with those five. So we're going to do a mini project, um, which is looking at some mental health data. The data is freely available. It's publicly available. It's about mental health beds and the capacity in England. So we're going to look at the number and the occupancy of mental health beds in recent years. There's a bit of background of it for people who are not familiar with mental health beds. I, I work in the Mental Health Trust, but I don't really use this data. So it's not something I'm hugely familiar with, but acute People trust people will be familiar with beds and capacities and usage. And so it's just a little bit of background for people. And there's the link as well to the original data. So this is where we get to practice as well a new script. Uh, I've written a few things, but I'm going to just create a new script. So if you go up to the little cross or to the file on the left hand side, just in the editor bit. And select file, new script. I can't do it with the mouse. This is why I use shortcut keys. You'll get a new script which has nothing in it. So we're going to practice loading data again. So we go to import data set, read R, and then you get this screen where it's got very little data, no information in there. I'm just going to look at the chat. You've gone quiet again, Zoe. I didn't really say very much, don't worry. And in interestingly, it was at the same point as last time. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's, I think I go quiet at that bit because I haven't really done anything more. So you haven't missed anything. I've just opened the, I've gone, to, I'll do it again. So import data set from text, read R. And that's where I pause and that's where it went quiet. And I've done no, no more. So I'm going to look for this data set called beds underscore data dot CSV. You can browse dot dot dot. I'm on the cloud. So the data is preloaded. Desktop, you need to have your data somewhere saved or use the script. Like Dom, you might have to do another script actually for this one. But the problem with this is that you'll install it without doing anything to it. And what we're going to do now is change it slightly before we import it. So if you go to beds data underscore CSV, open, we're going to get a preview of the data and it's going to be very typical of some of our public data sets where there's a bit of an issue with it. It's, if you install it, you're going to get columns called title and KHO3 return and X3 and they're not real column names. We really want the date the org underscore code and the org underscore name down here. That's very common in a lot of the data sets that we get. Hands up if anybody's not at that bit. And I've just kind of paused looking at the data. People have had problems with the sessions and things, unfortunately, I do apologize for that. Mike, it's clapping, is that good? Or does uh, that mean you, no, you need No, no, it's, it's a hand up. Um, yeah. Well, it's just, I, I've got this now, but unfortunately I wasn't able to get to the point of uh, actually viewing it after I've imported it with the last one. It kept on crashing. Um, oh, I'll okay. carry on with this now. And if that okay. doesn't work, I'll see if I can follow on the desktop one, if I can okay. get both links, because I think the first thing happened while I was resetting the PC. Oh, okay. And then it wipes the chat. Um, might, might be worth just watching on this one because yeah, if you yeah. can get that link, that link is a straightforward import. You don't get to change the date. You can change it, but we're not going over that structure of the code. You'll see it in a minute, but it, it's a bit of a, a disjointed thing for what we're following. So you might just want to watch. So I've got to this stage, which is quite common, where you look at your data and it's got the wrong title bits. I know where I want the column headers and it's not these ones. I want these ones. So we can skip uh, rows is the word I'm looking for. And you can say we want to go one, two, three, and we want to come to here. So if I do skip three and then click off, it will reset everything and show you what it is that you're trying to do. So I'm skipping three rows to get the column headers that I require. I think you can do that in Excel when you're importing data, you can tell it to skip. What's interesting down here as well is you get this little bit of code that says skip equals three. So it's written the code for you. You do it using the GUI 
front end, the friendly version of clicking and moving around, and then it gives you the code for future use. Oh, the other thing actually is on the, the uh, if you check the data column headers, not the headers, the type, the date comes through as a character. Dates are notoriously difficult no matter what you're using. I think the only thing I've heard that does work well with dates, maybe Python, but I don't know how to use Python, but I've had problems with dates in Excel and in, I'd say Power BI as well by extension and also with that within R. So this is a character. It's not seeing it as a real date, but you can change it within this view. And we can change it to date. And it says month, day, year, because this is an American sort of centered program. It does allow in some of the packages, our English spelling, so we can do color with a U and we can do summarize with an S, but often the dates are all default to the US dates. So you need to change it around D M Y and then click OK. And again, we're still in the view. We've not done anything with the data. We've not imported it like this. And it's a, uh, yeah, doesn't treat numbers as dates. There, are, there, there is a package actually that takes those date formats, the serial Excel date numbers, and it can change them into dates. And that's a very good package called Janitor. So there's a lot of data manipulation issues from Excel in many, even into Excel, Excel into Excel. But Janitor is a good package in R to clean up some of those things in, that come out of Excel as default. So now we've changed the date, we've got rid of those extra la layers of data and the code down here has got longer and we can still just copy it. Control C or right click and do copy. And we're looking at the data, it's telling us what it looks like and I'm going to cancel. I'm going to put it into Control V into my editor script. And then I'm going to click my cursor into the code and just do control and enter to run it. Or you can use the run code here, the run button, and that will run it there as well. And so now I can see capacity AE. Hands up or chat if you're struggling or have any comments on that. Has everybody got Beds underscore data into their top right area that you can see. Looks like they can. I'm going to look at my beds underscore data. I've clicked it, it says view down there, and it's taken a while. And there we go, you can see all of the data there. Now, it doesn't cover this in the course, but the one thing that I like doing is ordering. Now, it's kind of skipping ahead, and it could actually answer some of the questions that are posed in this presentation, but I use this all the time, so I can't keep that to myself. If you click on these little buttons here, it orders your data in your view. Now this to me is a little bit more, is much better than in SQL where you get your source, you get your output, you can't do anything with it, you can't order it, you have to code it to order. But this is more like Excel to me where you can just start filtering and you can look for things. So you can use this in another kind of way of looking at your data. But if I stop doing that, and give you the original look, which is this. You can see the observations are quarterly, that's on your date, and the scroll across, you can see the beds average and the occupancy average are at the end of your um, data frame. This is real data, so there are real issues which we will work with, it says. And this is why we need at least five. You might need more verbs, but we're gonna start with the five verbs of arrange, filter, mutate, So the course use it as giving it a metaphor, really, like the car and giving it an analogy, sorry, rather than a metaphor. I think there's a difference of base R being like a sports car and our studio being like a comfortable luxury car or just a comfortable car, it doesn't have to be luxury. When we're writing things in deep R, it's like creating a recipe. Everything is in its own format. It has to, one follows the other and how it follows is important, but it's, it's structured. It's like an instruction set. So we're using this 
example of a potato. A potato, you start with it and you're going to try and get mashed potato. So you need to peel it, slice it, boil it, and then make mash. You start with your object, and here we call it beds data, but in this story, we're calling it a potato. We're going to peel it. And we have these brackets after verbs, which you don't have in instructions for cooking, but you're telling the computer that there's more to it. So you're doing something behind the peel. So there's an, an action, which is what the brackets are really referring to. In slice, you can actually do your slices differently. So you could say the size, you can set the size, small, medium or large. And in this potato story, we're using medium. So the brackets can be an extension of many other things to your verb. Boil, time equals 25, and then you get your mash. The next part of the analogy, so we've, re we've removed then and put this kind of strange squiggle in there. This is referred to as a, a pipe. In Dplyr it's used predominantly, it's used a lot really, I should say, not predominantly. It is, when I look at some script and I see those pipes, I know it's in Dplyr. So your input object is your potato and your output, which isn't referenced in this, is your hot chopped potato, which is mash. Each step builds on the previous step. So it's in a logical order. But what is nice about dplyr is that it follows a human logical order. What people haven't, and I never realised this when I learned SQL, is that it doesn't run in the computer in the order that you've written it. That's not the case for dplyr. It runs as you said to do it. So your potato is the first bit, which is always the object. You peel it, you slice it and boil it. It doesn't twist around or change the order of things. What you're effectively saying is <laughs> do this, then that. Do this then that and do this. So you're, you're repeating yourself on your, your verbs. And it's, it's more of a, it is an action, it's a verb, you're doing something and there's always a then. So sometimes if you leave the then afterwards, it will, it will think then what you've told me then. So you have to be very clear that this is concise. So this is the end because there is no more, no further ends, no, thens, nothing else. Remove all that structure, you can see data frame, do your pipe, which means then, do this, rules, then, do this, and rules. You can, you can, it says here you can solve complex puzzles. Yes, you can really, really, this is, it's deceptively simple, but that's the good thing about dplyr, that you can build it, build on it, and build on it, and build on it. And this is really useful for our level of analysis where we're doing things. It's, it can sometimes be slow, I will say that, that's why there are alternatives, and you may hear people refer to things called data table or base R, but this is nice to see and it's nice to use and you can then break down your very complex problems into simple steps. So we're going to start with dplyr. The question we're going to start off with is which organisation provided the highest number of mental health beds? So a range is self-explanatory, it would be sort by or order by in other languages, what I'm going to write out is what's on the, the screen, beds data. What you could see there is actually it wanted to fill in the rest. So when you get something like that, if you do the tab key, I think that's the same for many other programs, it will fill it in for you, which is really good to, if you've got like long column names or long file names, it will just find it for you. And then doing then, does it say that? It does. Then is a really long thing where you do a percentage sign and a, and a forward slash and a percentage sign. But you can use shortcut keys again. And I use these all the time so that I don't even remember that I'm doing it anymore. Somebody did point out it's only one extra key or two extra keys more, but I, I really like it. So it's control shift and M for Mike. And you get your nicely spaced out and beautifully written. Not too sure why, what the history is with the pipe. I think it comes from another package called Magritar, which Dom has referred to in the chat, saying Sinapa, which is, it is not a pipe. There's some sort of joke thing in the community and I don't really, I should know it because I studied philosophy, but I don't get it. I think it's more art history. You go on to the next line. You can write on the one line, but it's just for ease of your eye and to make it sort of follow other people's structure. We always put it on another line and it always indents it so you can kind of see it better and it does it automatically. And then type the range, beds, 
AV, it fill, filled it in for me. And then if you do control and enter, it will show up in the console. It will run it in the console and then show you the top 10 lines. Now we know that there are a lot more in there. There were 4,558, but we only see the top 10 because you'd be scrolling through lines upon lines upon lines of code in the console otherwise. Just checking to see if everybody's following okay. Good. Um, now, it did, oh, yeah. Sorry, I, uh, no? I've started on our studio and I've gone for this stuff, but I don't have an arrange function coming up. Make sure you've got library. Oh, I've loaded it. That's the thing that I've done before. So library, tidyverse. Ah, right. Here, sorry. I, I, didn't I didn't even put that at the top of my script because no, I'd opened it in another script. Um, Zoe, actually, would you be able to test to, to, to paste yes. your current script into the chat, please? Because someone's asked whether they can have the um, call types. Just, yep. um, you shouldn't need the reader, I think. Reader's part of Tidyverse. You, do you want... Okay. I just got that from the thing. Yeah. Just all of that. Thank you. If you're using the cloud, Mike's okay, or is that a hand up? I'm okay. Sorry, it's a thumbs up. I... As you can see, yes. As you can see, it it's descending as automatic, and we were actually wanting. I'll just click back. You wanted the highest number of mental health beds. That's the lowest number of mental health beds. So we need to change the order of the arrange. And the way we do that is to do descending and then a bracket and a bracket. So you're doing a function inside of a function. So it's a bit like an if else, so you've got things all scrunched in um, or subqueries, a subquery within a query. You're saying descend is a function inside a function, which is a range. And if I run that control and enter, I get it the other way around. I'll just put that one in the code as well. And as you can see, actually, this one is my trust, Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust. This is from a few years back, though, and we don't have that number of beds in West Adelaide. It, it gave a couple of clinical psychiatrists a bit of a, a jump when they saw that when they did the course. Because they said, well, that's not us, that's not us, but we've shut some beds since then. That works for numbers and text, as it says there. So it's, it's very flexible. The descending is a good way of uh, controlling the data. So which two organisations provided the highest number of mental health beds in September 2018? So it breaks down the, 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 the subject, the, the question, sorry. Highest number, you're looking to use a range as before to find the, the highest, not the lowest, which would be the default. But we don't need all of them. This is what we have for all of them. We just need to restrict by a, a date period, which is quite frequent in our analysis. This is what we do. Okay, filter would be how we would reduce things. So I'm going to do, I'm going to write it out again. So beds, data, control shift, just to remind everybody about the uh, then, the Magritar pipe filter. When you do a bracket, you probably notice that it does the close bracket. It also does that for the quotes, so it always tells you it always finishes it off for you, which is nice. So when we want to filter by date, it's like a where clause, or I can't think what it would be in Excel. You're just uh, doing the, like the, the drop down arrow, wouldn't it, to filter. But this is code structure. I don't know how you would do that in Excel. We're trying to filter by the date column, which is called date. And interestingly, and I get caught out by this quite a lot, you need two equal signs when you're using it in a filter because you're using a test of quality not a, like a as, or a, call it this, one equal sign. So the, the format is date, it's uh, year. Sorry, uh, um, yeah. when you type in date um, to get it at yeah. the start, uh, I've got two dates come up, one with a blue thing saying date base, 
Okay. And the other big purple one, that's just a purple one. Uh, what's the difference between this? Base is, I think, base R, that's the verb. So if you look, if you hover over it, which is really useful as well, because it comes up later, it gives you some information about it. Now, that's the problem. Uh, Date is also a verb. It's called something. So it's calling, it, it's suggesting you could call a verb called date. This would be the date be. that you're looking for. Yeah. Date names will also give you some information and date names long and all this lot. So that's a useful way of seeing what it is. So if you've got a verb that you, you want to use and you can't remember what it's for, it will it will give you more information on that screen. So that was how I got that was writing date. Sweet, thank you. And leaving it a second, and then it gave me a bit more information. You can use Control Z as well to undo, which is what I'm doing. But if you want to redo, you can't do Control Y, which is a bit frustrating. It's Control Shift and Y, not Control Control Shift and Z to redo. So I'm just going to write that out. Control Z undo and Control plus Shift plus Z to redo. Undo. And then I've just commented them out so they don't cause problems. So what we're saying here is, is this true? Let's filter by it. That's what that last bit was on this thing. Is it is it true? Equals keep things that do match this. It's pretty similar to quite a lot of things in SQL and maybe other programming languages. I'm going to copy that arrange in there as well, because actually that was required, and add a pipe in there. So we're arranging first and then filtering. Actually, in this situation, you could probably filter and then arrange afterwards. I don't think it would make too much difference. And I'm going to run it. So it's Control, Enter, and then you get all this data here. How's everyone getting on? Any questions? I was just checking the chat box. There were no questions on that. Any hands up? Oh, Anna's had a, an error. Error in date. Comparison one is possible only for atomic and list types. I wonder if you've got it as a character rather than a date format. Dates are really tricky and notoriously awkward. Okay, which five organisations had the highest percentage bed occupancy? Thanks, Hannah. Um, in September 2018. Oh, as before, so we're, we're extending really on the code that we're looking for. We're looking for the range of the highest percentage is the thing that we're looking for that's new. We don't have percentage. So we've done two bits already. We've done the ordering, arrange descending. We've got the date filtered, but we don't have percentage bed occupancy. We can create it. And how we use that is a verb called mutate. So if I just do a new line here, so beds, data, control, shift, and the pipe again. And this time it's the verb mutate. So they called it, the name here is perk oc. Now you can call it anything, but this is percentage occupancy. You're making that name. So just to show that this is different, I'm going to do equals, it's only one equals. What's nice about dplyr is if you get the wrong equals in the wrong place, if you do two and it should be one, or if you do one and it should be two, it will tell you and it will say in the error, I'll do it here, it's a did you mean equals equals and I get caught out by that quite a few times. So it's a nice way of pointing you in the right direction to say I think you've got the wrong test of equality there. So this means as in SQL or just a renamed, like a named range in Excel. So you can call it what you like. But these two things here exist in the table. So if I look back at the table, you can see we've got beds AV and occupancy AV. If you click on the little uh, arrow next to the object, it gives you those top level bits as well. So you can also see what's in your data. If I go back, we want Occupancy average divided by beds average. Occupancy average divided by beds average. So it's found some data and it's giving you some options. So I'm going to select that one. It goes over that it's not a test of equality with one equal sign. It's really like as, or name it this. 
and you can name your columns what you like. But you tr we're going to talk about names in a bit, but you just have to make it meaningful and be careful. If you have a, it, you can re sort of change your existing columns as well. So if I called perk oc, oc av, it would rename my existing columns. So try to use new column names as well. So I'm just going to copy the last bit here, um, which was really all of this. The other way around. So we've done the mute. We've created the mutation. So it's a new column. Filter it by the date, and they're arranged by actually on this occasion percentage occupancy, which is the new column name. In a descending order. And then when I run it, control enter, I get. Uh, let me see if I can move them on. There we go. So per oc appears at the end of the far right hand side. It's a new uh, column. It always appears at the end. Very much like SQL. And I've ordered it by that new column, percentage occupancy, and I get two up here that have 100% occupancy. One of them's only got two beds though, so I'm not surprised it's at 100% occupancy, and then lots of other percentages. Is everybody okay with that? I, um, I was guessing this error and date uh, is possible only for atomic and list types issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I did copy the thing, and I've got for beds data the whole comma, call types equals calls, uh, dates equals call format, and all of that stuff. So I, I've got that in, but I'm still getting that atomic type issue. And mm -hmm. the second question, sorry, is just um, we've got the column date format that we decided would be day, month, year. Whereas it's shown in the table when it comes up as year, month, day, which is in reverse, is what what's going on with that? Yes, I think what we were doing is telling it that it's a date. So we were saying this is what you you should have it as, or this is this is a date. This is mm -hmm. our date format, but it's showing it in the international recognised year, month, date format with those lines. I think that's the way it's viewed in Tidyverse. That's a very good point and I'd have to go away to try and work out because dates are a bit like this. There's a package specifically called Lubridate. I'm just going to write that in the um, comments, which changes dates and helps you format them and look for the beginning of the week and the end of the week. Because what I'm kind of suggest that kind of getting from you is that it doesn't look, so if you're giving it to people, who want to see it in the format that we see it, date, month, year. This is what we have quite frequently in our ana an analysis. But we as analysts use year, month, day. It doesn't help lots of yeah. people. They don't know what we're looking at. And I think this is kind of going for the machine readable as opposed to the human readable. So that I would use probably Lubridate to change it around. I'm not entirely sure why. Cool. Yeah, it no, looks it, different. It just threw me because like uh, a minute ago, we said we're setting the date to be month, day, year. And then we do filter the date equals year, month, day. And so we, we told it we want it one way. But then yeah, when we're gonna... talking about it, the next moment, we're talking about it the opposite way, which Good point. I'm gonna is hard for me that to way. think about. Sorry. No, it doesn't like it. No, that's a really good point, because I think I, I like the computer, has kind of assumed year, month, day, because that's the international way, but that's not how we give our dates to people. That's not how we write them on the blackboard when we're at school, is it? That's not what we do, but I've just become too used to it myself, just kind of flipping to that. Um, yeah. I think what I've done is I've told the computer, this is a date, but it's not, yeah. But then like we'll, that. Well, when we're referring to it, we should still use the international standard when we're writing it in, so. Yeah, so I'm gonna look at Lubridate and see how to do that because I'm sure there are ways of getting it the other way around. There must be. And I've, I've encountered these problems in SQL as well. So I really, it's always a bit messy with dates, but yeah, thanks for that. It's useful. Is everybody uh, else okay? 
just to go on to the first question about that you had about um, the atomic error. Mm -hmm. It's because not running the previous line, so the beds data line isn't run. I've put an answer if you scroll back a bit in the chat. Um, just for some more time about that. Uh, it might be also useful if you could you could, could you paste your beds data script as well, please. Thank you. Last bit. Uh, be aware that I've called it per oc with no space, but on the slides it's got an underscore. So I called it something different to make it clear that you can name it anything, but I didn't want to call it completely differently. So I've called it per oc. Seems not to be working for you. Is it? So I'm looking at the chat. So mutate's not working there. Yes. If you, lots of things going off in the chat. So I'm going to keep going with the presentation for the moment as people get sorted out with the chat and making sure that they've got the right libraries in and things. The next question is what's the mean number of beds across all trusts for each value of data? We don't have the mean number of beds. This is a summary statistic that we're looking at. Uh, we can do those in, you can do it in SQL. It's a bit tricky, but it is possible. You can do it very easily in Excel, but it's not scripted. It's like you have to, well, you can script it in the sense that you put your formula at the bottom of your, your columns. But on this occasion, we're going to do it within this script. We're going to come out with one mean statistic rather than a, a column of data. And we're going to use the, to get that, we're going to use the verb summarize. So I'm going to write bed data. Okay. And then summarize. And again, I'm just calling it, this is, I'm going to call it as it says on the presentation, which is the name of the column that I'm creating, or name of the statistic. I'm creating it, so I'm giving it a name, that's mean underscore bed. Equals is not a test of equality, it's just saying this is what it's called. And then we use just uh, just mean, just one word, mean, beds, AB. And then control and enter. And that is what you should get. Because we've got missing values in the data, and a missing value is shown in R, as NA in SQL, it would be null, and in Excel, it would just be a blank cell. Sometimes it has a space in it, but really, if it's got nothing, it should have nothing in it whatsoever, so it has nothing said in it. If you try to do a mean on NAs, you get NAs, because you can't mean something that isn't there. So we need to remove those NAs, but there's a very neat way of doing it within the structure of that summarized code. So if I copy that, just so that you can see First bit, because some people are still sorting out their scripts and things. If I just add to this code where it says mean beds AV equals mean brackets, oops, inside there, next to the eight beds underscore AV, comma, na dot rm equals true. It says T in the presentation slide, but I'm just writing it out in full as true. What you're saying is na, which is the nulls, Remove equals yes, true, do it. Then I get a number. And it's a summary statistic, so it's doing a summary of the entire data set and it's just returning one thing back. How's everybody doing? I can see Dom's helping some people in the chat. Andrew, is that thumbs up for good or is that? You need some form. Is that a thumbs up? Hopefully it's a thumbs up. Cool. Yeah, thumbs up for good. Good. Great. Just seeing if anybody else. Yeah, so. Right. The next question then. What was the mean number of beds across all trusts for each value of the day? We're adding a little bit more in there. We don't want one 
number for the entire data set. I mean, sometimes you want that, but sometimes you're just interested in individual places and then comparing them. I will copy them, paste the script then. I'll do that. I'll do both of those across. So the top one in the chat is the just the usual summary statistic, which will give you NA. And the one underneath is when you remove your NAs and you get a, a real number. Uh, I was going to ask, I was actually asking Felicity to paste the script, but that's good too. Oh, was it? Which one did you want? The one no, about? No, that's fine. I was asking Felicity to paste the script. Oh, Felicity, sorry. I thought it was me. Sorry, because I didn't see the history. Okay, so that's useful, but it's, it's not something that we always want, where you want the entire data set, you want it broken down. So we know how to summarise, because we've done that summary bit, and uh, we need to break it down by each date. And we don't want to do that repeatedly. We want a way of doing that as one. So we can group by. And group by, for those who use SQL, it doesn't really exist in Excel. Uh, I'm just trying to think, no, Excel, you'd have to sort of order things in their, their groups before doing things to them. You could probably do it in a pivot table. But in SQL, we use group by often just to squash all your data that's the same into one line. But group by in this context is a bit like partitioning, which you have in SQL, where you do something to the data in those groups. So we're going to try and do by that's this statistic summary to each group by date. Now, when you do group by date, I'm just going to run it. You just see your data. It doesn't do anything to the data. It just shows what you've got. In the background, it's grouped it. It's done that partitioning. It said all these dates, they're the same, that's one. All of these, they're another one. And so it, it's sort of hanging in there like metadata that you can't see there. As it says there, if you do that control shift M, if you have the pipe, I'm just going to show what happens when you leave a pipe on. If it's expecting another line and you haven't done it, it doesn't finish what it's doing down here in the console because it's expecting you to do something else and I've not put something else in there. Very much like this presentation slide. Um, but what we're going to do- That's the error that Felicity is just having back. Um, uh, yes, it's very common. I do that all the time. Um, there is a so, nice way to avoid that actually. Is there? What's that? Yeah. Um, finish every script with select all. Oh, okay. So if I did- Select and scroll select. all. Oh. Yeah. And then just empty brackets. Ooh. Could not find function. Yeah. Ah, I had to go to the top of that particular chunk to run it. Sometimes it does that. Yeah. So there wasn't anything wrong with my script. It was just where I put my mouse key, my cursor. Ah, okay. So yeah, sometimes I've had it so it's led into something else and it doesn't make sense because it's leading to something that, yeah, so it gets into a bit of a tease. So that's, that's common. And so I'm going to add in summarize. So I'm going to do return there, summarize. So I've added, I've applied a group by in the script. I'm adding a summarize and I'm going to do the mean beds, which is the name I'm creating. Mean, which is the function. Beds, AV, which is the data set. Again, not data set, is the column, sorry. And then na.rm, remove your na. Enter. So now I've got more numbers where the first time I used summarize, I just got one number back. Now I've got several numbers. Those numbers are the mean beds by each date. And the way I've done that is by using the group by, which doesn't show up in your data. Now the problem with it not showing up in your data is that you can forget about it. And I've done this too because unlike in SQL where you group by and then it's done, in R or dplyr packages, when you group by, it stays there until you say to remove it. So it will apply to anything else that you do in your other data. I'm just thinking. So you need this sort of like sub verb. It's not a verb in its own. It needs to be with group by your ungrouping. You're just saying, clear it out. Sorry, I didn't even realise. So it runs the same data, it gets the same summary, it's just removing that metadata that you couldn't see. 
And it's really useful to remember that if you get some weird errors coming through or it says, you know, this is ungrouped by, I can't do this. Just check that you have an ungrouped by. I think if you use summarize on its own, I think it can ungroup. No, that, that, that wouldn't make sense. Some of the verbs do kind of clean up after themselves, but it's always good if you've got a group by to ungroup by and not think of it in the same way as SQL. Anna's got a different message, no applicable method for group. I'm just going to copy my code in there so that you can try that and see if that, oh, solved it, cool. That's my code anyway, if you needed it. Yeah, I think it was a, a running from the wrong line like you were doing earlier. Ah, oh, okay. Next question. There's lots of questions on this. Which five organizations have the highest mean percentage bed occupancy over the five year period? So we need to create the new variable because we didn't have that in the original data set. We need the percentage bed occupancy, which we did before, so we could copy it from there. We need to do it for each of the organizations. And we also need to create this mean, which is a summary statistic. And as before, a range. So there's a lot of stuff going on in there. So there are a couple of tips, because there's a lot of stuff happening. The idea would be to build up on your code. So as I did here, you've got beds data summarize, and then you can add in a line. You can run it each time. So um, I'm going to ask you to do this and follow it through using these numberings as kind of a hint. So I'm going to write it as you're going to try it as well and see if I can remember what to do. So we're going to do it in the order of the numbers and we can run it each time we do a new line just to see if it gets what we think it should get. And if we get an error, then we can deal with that error as we go along. If you do have some long code that stops working, you can also, as I said, you don't need to, but you can just highlight your code and run parts of it, which is useful, similar to SQL. So we start off, we've just been using beds data. So beds data is the object that we're using. Control shift and M, I think it was for the pipe. I've forgotten the name of the key. Number one, create a new variable as we did before. So create a new variable is mutate. And percentage bed occupancy, I'm guessing, equals. And we want percentage bed occupancy. So I'm going to... So you're, you're going quiet again just a little bit. That's now, good because I'm just, I'm not really making sense anyway. I'm just kind of dithering as I'm going along. I always have to do this one and think about it. So percentage bed. did we do before? It was that one, wasn't it? Percentage occupancy. I'm just going to copy it. then for each of the organisations. Let's see if I got this right. Over to you. Sneak preview. Oh, that one right way. So I forgot the thing there. I think you have gone very quiet again. It might be when you're looking at your other monitor. Not saying anything. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, that's kind of confusing. No, I was just I was looking at my own code. I got it to run, 
without the na dot rm equals true. So I've, it didn't need it, I don't think. I got the same results. So this bit here, I forgot to do. I can't highlight it, it doesn't work. And it was okay. So it's just very interesting. Brackets are very troublesome. You have to make sure that you have closing brackets to things. And on one occasion I've run it, you're probably concentrating on your machines on your, your code. Add it. If you just scroll over your um, bracket, you can sort of see the corresponding opening bracket. So you can kind of work it out. My connection's unstable, so you might not see that. concentrating so I'm not saying anything now. There we go. Yeah, they're the same. So I've just discovered the na.rm equals true is not necessarily required. So I'm going to post the code with the na.rm equals true into the chat. Has anybody got any issues? That was actually quite complex and I do it frequently and I forget which bits mean, which bits summarize, what percentages. It's a lot to remember, but what's nice when you scripted it is it's done. So you can just refer back to what you've got. I don't know whether to move on or if people have just got concentrating faces on because I can't see any faces. Hands up if you finished. Some people are still working on it then. Thank you. Daniel, your hand's got stuck up there. Is that a hand for help or is that a hand from me saying, have you thin it up? It's gone down. It's a good opportunity for me to talk because otherwise people might think that <laughs> it's all broken. No, there's a question. How do you list just the top five? It doesn't cover that in the in, in the um the code. Uh, I think. Right. So slice is very similar to the group by in. Um, well, not sort of group by. So group by in SQL, you're squishing all of your familiar things down into one. Now I tend to do group by in R and then slice one because I just want one copy. But what I'm actually taking with slice is the top one. I'm just taking one. So you can say slice 10. Slice is slightly different. You're saying I want number 10 returned. So if you're saying I want one to five, I would do it one to five. That makes sense. So 
grouped them all together, done the statistic, I haven't ungrouped actually, and then I'm taking one, two, three, four, five. So this means taking one, uh, row one to row five. You're not taking them randomly. Hmm? Interestingly, I put post a different version in the chat. <laughs> oh, top N. Top yes. N for N. That's another way around it. Oh. No, that's good, because it's one of those where you've got various ways of doing it. Interesting. Yeah, I, tried the top N top is a I couldn't think of the verb in this. Top end came up with an error. Oh, did it? What error did you get? One second. I've just got to deal with the dog who's biting. Okay. Yeah. Got biting Andrew said, do you have the underscore? I missed it first. Um, the underscore in your, in the verb or just on the keyboard? Yeah, it does work. It's, it's, you've got to remember to put your little point. You know. Yes. Yeah, you're saying then. So if you don't have the then, it doesn't see it as being part of the same structure um, script. That top underscore N is going to sort of come back next because um, N is referred to cross in R and in statistics, which I hadn't realised, I stupidly asked somebody once, what does the N mean? And they said number. It's like, oh, OK, never really done that before. Missed that. And I see it a lot in dplyr. So I will just go on to the next slide just to kind of explain some of this as people are still working. It's in the code is on the screen and it's also in the chat that I've used to answer the question previously. But as an extension, when we're using observations, if we, if we want to count the number of observations, you can use N as, again. So if I do beds, data, pipe, summarize, I want just one number. tells me all of the numbers in there. So it's just how many observations, which you can see up here, it says 4,558, but it's just a nice way of doing it. It doesn't say it in this, but I tend to, oh, that's the solution actually, so we've got the solution there. Because when you have a summary statistic, the point for this part of the presentation is to say that sometimes you have these summary statistics, so you might have 100%, and you think that's really good, but how many observations are behind that? How many rows of data? It's really important to put the number in as well, which is when that comes into its own, which is N bracket bracket. So then you can say, oh, well, there are only two, there are only two beds. So of course it's 100% because they're really, really small numbers. And we can just add that to the code. As it says on this code bit. And then I've got the mean beds that I've added in and then I've got the number next to it. So actually you can see Bradford has got three beds. So, so I think that's right. Yeah. Not many beds in there. I'll put that code into the chat as well. There are lots of verbs like that. I didn't know the top underscore N. And I will go into a bit of detail about how to find things that you think, I want to do this, how do I do it? Without having to know the exact name of things. Hands up for those who finished and ready to move on. Or some people might have disappeared actually and it's tricky to say there's quite a few people now that's brilliant okay has anyone not finished that would like yeah to yeah we've got problems anna was that hand up for that daniel hand up for a bit more time okay is that right a bit more time these hands flash up and down 
while people are doing that, the other one that I like, which doesn't work in this data set because they are all unique, when I'm using things with patients, I often have lots of data about them, lots of contacts, lots of referrals, but I want to count distinct patients. And so you can do count distincts and things like this, but following this number equals N, there is a verb N distinct. And you can put in there what you're counting. So if I'm counting org name, there's only one because there's only one statistic, so I'm only counting one. But that's really useful if you're looking for patients. I use that a lot more than I do N on its own. So I'm just going to write that in the chat as a completely separate thing. Um, okay, Chris, thank you for that. Hands up, anybody who needs a bit more time while you're doing this. In this one, Anna, the count distinct is counting the name of the organization name and it only appears once, so you only get one. It's not a very good example in this way, but it is incredibly useful if you're counting, say, contacts of patients and you want to know how many patients that refers to. I mean, I might have patients that have 15, 20 contacts, but I only want to see one or two people. So it's a really useful verb, not in this context, but I really like to mention it because I use it so frequently in my code. Okay, right, solution was there, adding a summary statistic. Now the final verb, so I might have lost Chris already, but this is a really good one. Now, if you're familiar with the SQL code, um, as we've seen at the, this, well, if I take it to this, when we create a mutation, we create a new column, it appears at the end. And sometimes it's the most useful thing and we want it actually the beginning, or we want to only select certain columns. And SQL is basically select many column with all the column headers. And I'll do that here. So you've got beds, data, pipe, select, org code, which will come first, and org name. I've just put my lines on two lines just because I like them like that, but it can run as one. And I've only returned two columns now from the data. So it can kind of take very, very big data sets into just what you're looking at, which is very useful. You can remove a column, which is so useful because you may have like 15 columns of data. You want all of them, but there's only one that's a bit like a code and you don't need that anymore. And instead of having to list out 14, which is could be a lot of typing, you can just do minus org code. So you get your data set as it was, just without that one column of code, which doesn't make as much sense as a name. We saw that with slice where you can use numbers. Columns are actually numbered in, in the data frame as well. You can refer to the columns by the number of their position. So one to three selects, I'll just write this in actually. I overtyped my stuff and I shouldn't have done that. So you've got this data select one, two, three, as in one colon three. So you just get, that's it, sorry, it's a bit slow. The first three columns, which was date, org code, and org name. That's okay, but just be careful if you use data frames or you add things that you're referring to the position, not to the column. So if you change the column name, that doesn't make any difference, you'll still bring it back. If you put something else there, you may get something back that you didn't require. So I tend to always use the column names so that then there's no confusion. And you can do that with that colon as well. I don't know if it says it in there actually. It doesn't. I'll just show you. So if I did beds, data, select, date, colon, org, name, get exactly the same as when you refer to the position. Position can be useful because you might go one to 20. I want all of those without having to name all the 20. But if you're using code that you think may get changed, it could be a bit of a problem in the future. Is everybody okay with that? A 
very neat little verb in the select statements in dplyr is everything. This is really nice, particularly if you create the mutation of the new column at the end of the data frame and you want that at the beginning and then you want everything else to be the same. Instead of having to name them individually, you can just go beds, data, uh, pipe, select. I'm going to put org name at the beginning, if I can find it. Name, and then comma everything and it's a verb so it's got the brackets even though you don't put anything in it because you're just saying just take everything but it's a verb and then it does a nice order that doesn't exist in SQL so that's that's me hooked in this now because you can't do it in SQL in Excel you could do it you could move them around but the thing is it's just if you moved it around and then gave somebody your your spreadsheet and then said I moved this you'd have to explain how you moved it is Mike, Mike, is that a clap because that's good or does it need, do you need help? Oh, no, so it's a question. So, so yeah. uh, for everything, when you put it in, does it kind of have the subtext of everything other than what you've put just behind the everything? That's right, yeah. So that's a good so, point, yes, it yeah. does. It doesn't repeat it, yeah. Thank you. Because if you look at the, the thing, yes, it, it just, yeah, it doesn't it kind of, I guess it knows because you named it, yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. I'm going to skip to naming objects because it's part of this manipulation of data. But some of this, be aware, does refer to the ggplot2 part of the presentation. So it might be a bit confusing. I'll try and highlight when the bits that can be ignored at the moment. So when we did the beds data, which we didn't, we, yes, we've been messing around with beds data. Sorry, I've forgotten what I've been doing. You do a lot with your data and you want to keep it. You don't necessarily want to keep the script. You do want the script, but you also want to do stuff to the object itself. You, you, you created a data frame. I want to put it into a chart, for example. So I've got this data that I've done with the beds. I want to make a chart with it. And what we haven't done because we've skipped it is this ggplot data at the bottom here. So don't worry about it too much, but just get it the concept in your head that I've produced this, object, this data frame, I've, I've tidied it up, I've put some statistics in it, I now want to put it into a chart. How do I get that into the chart? So you can actually, this is where it becomes quite good in deep, uh, tidyverse generally, you can put all that code into your charting data code uh, but it, it does make it difficult to debug because now you've got two things in there and it can be quite big and unwieldy so that's one thing you can do so it has the flexibility of being able to do that but it's often better to keep the two things separate now, some people do feed them into each other they do mix them perfectly fine I like to keep them separate so that the data manipulation is separate completely to the chart and sometimes I do several bits of data manipulation on my data frame. I change it two or three times because you're using it for different things. And so it's always easy, it says here, to make your code readable as possible. So to do that, to try and keep it as simple as possible, chunk it, write notes to yourself and for other people. And one of the solutions for this particular scenario is naming it. So you can name like you created new columns. You can create a new object up here. And so it needs a name. And we sort of touched upon this before when I looked to changing some of the names. You need to think of a decent name. We want to replace all of this code and just refer to one thing, a name. It's a bit like a macro in Excel or a procedure, stored procedure or a function in SQL. Names are really hard to do though. It says here, you've got to get something that's concise Meaningful, Murray is a name, but it's not really the most appropriate name for this. And it's got three things here. It says descriptive, short-ish, and consistent with your other naming conventions. One of the things I've seen quite frequently, and I did this myself, is using X. So X equals this and Y equals that. But when you then have X and Y on your X and Y axes, you're going to say X equals X or Y, it can get a bit muddled. So do try to think of a good name. And it is hard, but with practice, it gets a bit easier. So this one, they've, they've come up with beds underscore TS. I think the TS may be time series because it's over time, I'm guessing. So there's a thing called an assignment operator, which should, you can use equals as well, but people sort of predominantly use this arrow and uh, hyphen key. 
it's two keystrokes. There is a keystroke shortcut. And I think it came from the fact that people used to have this on their keyboards when they used the free software of R, they used something called S and I think it was on their keyboards. So it's just stayed. So it does mean that when you look at somebody's code, you can go, oh, that's R. And I recognize that that is a naming convention. That's the, uh, the like, as. So the way of doing it, I think it will come up with it. It's shortcut is Alt and a minus. So the, let's just say Alt and minus. I do it too frequently. It's up by your backspace key and you've got a plus sign and it's the one next to it between the zero and the plus. So if I wanted to name this code, I'm just going to find the code here. This big long code here, because there's a lot in there. I want to keep that now. I can call it, I could actually call it beds underscore data, but it would completely remove all my old code, which is why it's good to call it something else. So I'm going to call it beds underscore TS. And then I'm going to use, without doing any spaces, alt and minus, and it puts the spaces in and it puts the arrow equals thing in there. And now if I do control and enter, it appears up here as its own object, which I can refer to again. I can change it, I can add to it, I can put it into a chart. And then when I refer to it in the chart, I'm only referring to one name as opposed to the whole code that was used to create it. Okay, so when it says down here, this is a good point. So I can look at my beds TS. I can either click on it there and it says view down there. You could write view. You can see the code there, the code for the data frame. If I just move that down there. You can write it like that and you can see it will go to the view. Or you can actually just write beds TS and then control enter. So you can just view the top. There are different ways of viewing it. This view code, clicking on here, shows you the entire data set as a frame in itself, or you can just look at the top 10 by just doing beds TS. There are different ways of looking at your data. The key point is that you're putting your name here on the left and then you do your assignment in the middle. When I do the um, less than and minus thing, it, it, it doesn't go blue or separate things out or anything so you're doing the, you're doing it longhand are you so the less than key and then minus and then space it comes out blue are you do are you on the cloud sorry this is the cloud isn't it so oh no no, no it's uh it's desktop because it kept on crashing for me on cloud oh god sorry about that um so What's it showing as on yours? Uh, just grey, normal text. I did beds to oh. less, than, less than, minus, and, and like nothing happened. And then I added spaces each side and, and nothing happened. So when you run that code, does it run it at all? Or does it just give you an error message when you try to run it? Uh, it says error in view. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, beds TS. Uh, it, it shows all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. And then at the end, I say, view it, but I don't get anything. Try replacing it with equals. It will work with equals. Could you post your code the into the chat, actually? And then have a look at it. That's a good idea. It's really an aesthetic thing with the equals. It worked it's fine just... with the equals. Yeah, it's not conventional, but it doesn't mean that it can't be used and it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be used. There's probably going to be discussions about it or have been discussions about whether people prefer it or not. I think the thing is to sometimes go with what your colleagues might know as well. But if you have a problem, then that makes sense to get around it, doesn't it, to stop having issues. Everybody OK? OK. As I referred to before, it becomes an object in here and you can see some of the objects. You can see how many observations and variables they have. And this is the ggplot2 code. This is the example which will be very unfamiliar to you because the syntax is slightly different. But this is the data that you're saying that you're trying to plot, which is all that beds data there. So several lines of code. 
just shows you that you can just refer to an object now, which makes it a lot easier to debug to uh, look at the code. Because it may be that the problem is not with the chart code, but with the manipulation to the chart. So that's why I try to keep them separate. So you run them individually to each other and just have one thing to refer to. Ignore that. So you don't need to do that for the, because this is all about ggplot. I think to summarize, give the object name. No, you don't. So relational data. Now this is very important when you're, this is what we've done previously is just work on one flat X, uh, CSV. So one flat data frame. But often we want to merge things together. We want two or three data sets to be together to make some, uh, to, to analyze and to make some sense of. In SQL, we use joins and they are the same in dplyr. And in R, not R, sorry, in Excel, you'd use VLOOKUP or HLOOKUP, which is its lesser known uh, lookup system. Maybe MATCH, maybe CHAR index. You do those kinds of things to get your data to pull from other data sources. SQL is much closer to dplyr than what we're going to do now, but I'm going to go over what joins are available and how they work, just to refresh people's minds and also to try and bring those who don't use SQL up to the fore. So we're going to look at the, the common joins, which are left joins. And with a, a left join, just for those people, like, like with VLOOKUP, you've got your data on the left side and you're trying to join another one to it. So you keep your left side. And if it doesn't match to anything, it stays there. So it will bring it across, even though it doesn't match to anything on the right. That's the left join. So this is just an example. Table one doesn't exist. It's just an object name just to refer to something. The structure is quite similar in how it's written out as in SQL. You refer to left join, which is the function. Table two is a made up table, just to, as an example, to say we want to, to join by this. And then you can tell it, you don't have to, but you can determine, you can say specifically which columns you want to join by. In SQL, as you remember, you have to say what you're joining by, but in R, you don't actually have to. It can try and catch them itself. It doesn't always work, but it can be useful and a bit of a shorthand if you're doing quick coding. So we're going to join two tables together, which is a nice way of practicing in importing again the data that we require, because that's a really key part of getting your data in. So it's good to practice it. So we can try that again. And we're going to create a new table from a table about cases, and population. So we're going to import these two data sets. So I'm going to do this as well. I'm going to import data set, read R again, browse. I'm on the cloud, so I've got these data sets. Uh, a couple of people were on their desktop, so Dom, is it okay if you could just send some code for this? Or I could send it, or you're doing it from the web. If you could do that for these two, CSV files, that'd be brilliant. I'm gonna try and take a note of this for the future courses so that you can have them straight away. So there's table, cases, CSV. You can see it, it's, it's fine. We don't have to do anything to it, thankfully. So I'm just going to copy that code just because that's what we've done before. I was just looking for an image of um, the, the join um, as diagrams because I found that very helpful personally. I wonder if it's actually here. I've, I've pasted a link into the chat. Oh, thank you for that. Going up. No, but I've got a whistling sound, so I don't know if it's just on the, the sound. Import data set, read R again, and I'm going to import TB pop. Open. And I'm going to copy. You can just go straight to import, but I'm just going to write the code there. So can see it. And then I'm going to do control and enter, and control and enter. And then I've just realized. I'm just going to pop, pop that into the chat if anybody just wants to have a look. 
we didn't do anything to the code. We didn't need to look at, not the code, the data itself. We didn't need to change it. So we've just gone and installed it, imported it, losing the, the words today. So TB cases, I'm just going to do the uh, control shift and M for the pipe, because this is all in dplyr, which is in a uh, package within Pydiverse. Left join, just found it. And I'm going to join it to the other one, which was TB pop. Now in the presentation slide, it says by country. I'm just going to show you, just because I'm being, oh, error, TB cases. Ah, I left off the S. You can just do it. But as you can see here, which is actually the answer uh, to another question later, it automatically finds two columns and does it itself. So I do by equals country. There we go. I'm going to not deviate. I'm just going to follow the uh, code and do it properly. So do left join to the second table and can tell it to join on country as it tells me to do. I'll stop deviating. Now. Okay. Does everybody need, anybody need more time? So what we can see is that when you've got the, you've got duplicates and I've given away some of it, I think you could probably guess the duplicates are because we are getting 1999, 1999, 1999, 90. The 1999 Brazil is joining to each one of the other ones. And it's, it's making too many because you've got four dates in the right side, on the left side, I think. So you've got 1999 joining to 1999, 1999 joining to 2000, 1999, because we've only joined on the country. So you've got duplicates and it's kind of nicely detailed here. So you've got one on the left joining to four on the right. To stop that, you can copy this. Now, I was a bit ahead of myself and I do apologise that I was jumping ahead. I like to do that so I can copy the code in all honesty, because it tells you what the code is. So I'm just going to copy that and then write it out again. TB underscore score cases, pipe left join, TB pop, is it? Comma, I've got two commas there, by C, country, comma, year. The, the columns are in quotations and then when you run that you don't get those duplicate columns that you saw before I got year.x and year.y they've all gone now because they've matched it they've gone oh yeah is the same as year so it's the same and you only get Brazil where you should expect it in 1999 you get one in 10. Do I need to explain that a little bit more clearly because I kind of went back and forth and back and forth hands up if I if you want me to go over that again What the course was saying to do was to join and specify your columns that you're joining on. So country appears in the two data sets, country. So we stipulate country, but the problem is between the two data sets is the years in there as well. So the year on the left side, 1999, and country Brazil was joining to Brazil on the right four times because it appears four times because you're only saying by country. So it just ignores everything else and it says, oh, it's here four times. And that's not right because the dates didn't match up. So you had 1999 matching with itself and then 1999 with the subsequent years of 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. So to get around that, and you can do this with data sets, you can add as many columns to join on as you require in this scenario, we're, we're joining by country and year because they both appear in both tables and then you don't get the wrong, erroneous duplications. What you then do is you get your population matched to your left side, which is what you're looking for. C, 
see in this context is a very common thing in base R and it means combine and it means that you can string details. Uh, it, it's very new to R. I, I don't think I've seen it in it. Well, not, not new to all programming, certainly not ones I've seen before like SQL. You don't tend to use C like that. And it, it means combine. I just think of it as a list actually. I'm saying I want you to join on more than one thing. Here's one of the details. Here's another one, maybe a third, maybe a fourth. Is it just Always in partitions. What, sorry? Is it just the same kind of as a behind the scenes concatenate from Excel, basically? I thought of it as concatenate, but it's not because you're not squishing them together. Because concatenate is taking two columns and making them the same and making it one new word. It's it's seeing them separately, but it's saying take into account this, 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 and this, and this, and this. So very good for in so if you're looking for something with more than one column so you're still treating them separately concatenate actually does something slightly different concatenate does exist as a verb in oh no I, as well. I, oh right oh, no so yeah, yeah i just meant like behind the scenes so you could like filter by it but you can the ones on the front separately yes you can filter by it but i think it's just that it's slightly different in what it's doing to concatenate but you certainly can do the same oh. things Thanks. yeah now this is when the two tables have the same names, which is brilliant because it goes country, country, year, year. That doesn't always happen. I have got NHS numbers and it may be NHS, capital NHS number. And then in another another table, I've got says NNN. Now I know that they're the same, but if I just put that into R, I need to stipulate that this NHS number equals NNN. So, this is an example where they have different names and these tables don't exist. These are imaginary tables. So we're using our current table, which is cases, but we're joining it to this bad named, badly named table called bad names. In there, what you need to do, instead of saying country and year, which is what we said before, we need to say country equals place, which is the badly named column. And the second column is year with a all lowercase matching to year with this uppercase Y and lowercase R. They have to be the right way round. So if you get them the other, they're not interchangeable. So you can't say place equals country and year equals year. It won't read that. It has to be country matches your left side and place equals your right side. Yes, we're going to cover the, uh, the hints in a bit, Dom. I'm just checking the things. Is everybody okay with that? It does crop up a lot, as in when you're ma matching your data. If the instructions are not clear enough when you go through them again, if you need to do that, I will refer back to it, but there is a Slack group that we have for NHSR community. And I've posted some very simple questions in there. So no question is too simple. If you get stuck, please post something in there. And many, many people will jump in and try and answer that as soon as possible and help you because even when you've done some things, you can forget or because we cover a lot of stuff in this day in this course and you can learn a lot in um, R generally, it can be quite overwhelming. So if you go away, try it a few weeks later and think, I can't remember, I vaguely remember this bit, but I don't even know where it is in the presentation slides. Just ask and people will, that's the key bit to this as well is that people are really useful to help with all this stuff. But I will cover the hints generally for this stuff too. So there are other joins as in, uh, SQL, people will be familiar with inner joins, outer joins, right joins. Some of those are rarely used. Inner join is used a few, uh, quite a few times. There are a couple of other ones which I use in dplyr, which do exist in SQL, which I didn't know about, anti-join and semi-join. They're interesting. And if you Google those or look at the, or show you how to do the help files, you can get some more information about it as well. But essentially, if you come from a SQL background and you use a particular join, it will work the same in dplyr. Okay. So as Dom has hinted on here, because I think it gets covered in the ggplot too, there are various help functions on here. I can't quite recall where they are in all this, the different things, but so we were looking at the joins. There are different ways of getting the help in the join. You have to have the package that you're using installed. So I've already got I just noticed that once when I didn't have it loaded, I tried to do a, a hint help thing and it couldn't find it. 
you can type question mark in a join. Actually, I'll do that new one I was talking about, semi-join. It comes up with the information, gives you a bit of information here. But if you then do return, not return, control return up there, it brings this help file down here, which gives you what you'd find if you Googled it and said, what semi-join? If you went to the uh, Tidyverse pages, this is exactly what it has in its documentation. So I, when I first used this, there's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't quite understand. So it tells you really what all, what things go into it. I didn't really understand that, still don't. But what if you do, if you scroll right down to the bottom, what can help a bit is you sometimes get these examples. Sometimes you get a lot more than that. That can help you put it into some context. Google is your friend with any coding. Uh, it's just sometimes the difficulty is knowing how to Google it, what it is you're looking for. You can put your semi-join in the the console down here, you can say question mark semi-join. You can also just click on it and press F1 and you'll get the same one. So I'll just do a different one because I didn't show up. And T, T join. So I'm in it, my cursor's right next to it and I'll press F1. Oh, maybe I need to press F1. There we go. Oh, it's the same one, sorry. <laughs> The join didn't change because it was the same one. So if I do something like uh, summarize and then F1, it'll change the help file. You can also search in help here. So if I look for mutate, it gives me some examples there. As a hint, I don't know whether you mentioned it, you don't have to have the library loaded to, to get the help you, file. No, you, you, you have to refer to it, don't you? No, no, you can do double question mark. Yeah, I haven't really covered that, so I was avoiding that. But yes, you're right. So if I went to, well, if I do... I just search for forest as my example. Tidyverse. You get this thing here that says double... No, no, double question oh. mark. Oh, what's that so, one? Sorry, double question... I don't know that one. Sorry, I thought that's um, what I meant. So if, if you something. like say, type like double question, two question marks and then oh. uh, say the word forest. Oh, nice one. That one. Yeah. So if I did... Then the word... Then a, then a function. Do I have opened something yeah, and which doesn't list. like it? Yeah. No, it? It works it fine. It's, yeah, I don't have that package. That I, the, the verb is the real page. one. Yeah, I was looking for something else, but it's not the right one. Um, yes, that's quite good. So that's, that's good. I didn't know that. And you can also, you know, when there was the um, conflict between the filters, you can write your functions like that. So if I put tidyverse in front of it, I'm saying I want the left join to come from this package. Oh, left join is not supported on tidyverse, it's not tidyverse, is it? Oh, I see. There we go, sorry. I was using the wrong package name, I had to be specific. So you can put that in front of every single function that you have, and you might not need to because it kind of messes things up, but if you have a, a clash, you can say I want this filter from this package. And I'll just go on to some other help things that we do, other ongoing learning. It takes a while using R um, because there's a lot to learn. There, there are different packages people throw out. There's just wanting to do things really quickly in your data because if you're familiar with Excel and SQL, and you're under pressure for time, it's very easy to go back to what it is that you know. And I've done that myself. When you're under lots of stress and strain, you just go to what you know. And I've done that for a long time with SQL and then put it into R and then it takes time. It's taken me about two years to get to this level where I have vague understanding of where I'm going wrong, not always knowing the answers. So total immersion is always the best way, uh, but the, there are two ways of doing that, I find. One of them is to find something that isn't under time pressure because that can be very stressful. The other thing is to do something that maybe you already have done before. So it's quite good if you've got something already written so you know what you're looking for. So if you've got something in SPSS, say, with some statistics, that's a nice example for some people who use statistics. You want the number that you've generated from your statistical package. If you do it in R, then you know you're on, along the right lines. You can do that with your data sets too. It's just that when you're looking for summary statistics, it's nicely, it's much easier to do that. It is rewarding as well when you get started. It opens up a whole world of things to uh, 
do so you can produce all sorts of things as i said are as kind of been used for things that perhaps it wasn't always intended to to, to be used for which it, that shows its flexibility quick fixes though um because this is the beginner's course and even then you might want to might want to go back over things there are webinars and talks and quite a lot of books but the key thing when you get stuck on some things google you always go to google i always google now i always do Stack Overflow is a good one, but you need a bit of a strategy. So I'll just go through some of that thing with Stack, Stack Overflow. It's been going for a number of years. So questions have been posed like decades ago and answers can be very old and packages themselves have evolved over time. Dplyr, for example, I've referred to that a few times, wasn't always called Dplyr. It was called Plyr before. And so there'll be answers still on the Stack Overflow system or the, the website, I'll show you an example here, where some of them are very old. So I think this one's from eight years ago. I've seen older. And they've got data table here, which is another package that I referred to. There's base R. People do nicely explain where it's from. Sometimes they give two or three answers to things. So using Stack Overflow can take a while to use. Dplyr is what we've just learned, so I would go for that. So when I search for things, I tend to do like inner join dplyr, because if you put inner join, you might get even SQL responses. And even in SQL, you might get things like MySQL or PSQL, or it, uh, Post, Post, Postgres or something. I don't know how to use those ones. I don't think they're too dissimilar, but slightly different. So best to always go for what it is that you're using. Plyr is very old, but it's had a number of upticks because it was useful. A long time ago and it does work and if it is on your computer it hasn't gone completely it is still there you get upticks so it can be a bit deceptive always using the upticks ddply i don't know that one and as we get down to some of the newer ones even towards the bottom this is quite new i think this uh, 2019 you might get new verbs which appear at the bottom of stack overflow which are useful uh, but haven't had those upticks because they haven't been there long enough. So just use it with caution, but be careful of how you mix. When I first did it, I mixed a couple of packages together and things would clash or they wouldn't work in the same way because I just didn't really know what it was I was supposed to be looking for, which is why this course is kind of just designed for one package only. And um, we don't really go into much detail about BASAR and we don't really talk about other packages because it can be a bit complicated and confusing. So I would suggest using Tidyverse as much as possible. And then as you become more proficient, feel free to change your style and your area of where you work. It just, it's a guide to get you started and then you can go and flourish and try other things. Longer term fixes for learning R because it is a, a longer process and you're always learning, to be fair. I work with people who've been doing this for over 10 years or so. And in that time things have come in or they're using new stuff. I get to teach them new things because I'm learning new things and they didn't know about them, that new things are coming in. This is referenced a lot and lots of people do refer to it. I haven't read it myself, but I really should, I think. Um, R for Data Science, which has been written by Hadley Wickham with this other person, who doesn't get so much of a mention because Hadley Wickham is like the key person. The book is available free online. It's all available. You can buy it in paper form, but it's nice that you can reference books. There, is, there are also other courses. I've not done Modern Dive myself. This is an online learning thing. There are other online courses like MOOCs, as they call them, massive open access sort of thing. courses. I don't think access, that would not work. Uh, edX and Coursera, they do data science courses and they cover R. Sometimes they cover base R to start you off. And I started with that and I got very confused because I was coming from a relational database background and it didn't make much sense. It makes a bit more sense now that I've used R a bit more and I've seen a bit of code. But to start off with it, I really struggled. But that was me. Some people really like to get to the nitty gritty and build it up from there, which is admirable. There are blogs, quite a lot of blogs. I think the key part about R is that it's a community. So even though we've kind of rushed through a lot of stuff here, your learning will go on after this. How I learned was not necessarily through courses alone, it was through people. Now, some people read a lot 
and that's great and they write a lot as well so blogs are brilliant and there's a lot of them i found that my learning was through asking people questions like we've had a few questions here like how do you select the top five because it's your next progression of your step when you're working on some code i want to do this next how do i do that my first go-to was always to people and i was just lucky that i had a couple of people around me but we do have Stack Overflow, not Stack Overflow, sorry, Slack for our community, which is really nice because it's a group of people of mixed abilities and really, really helpful, who also have healthcare, health and social care and some other academic backgrounds. So they understand what it is we're trying to do as well, because sometimes it can be a bit confusing when people use examples, I found anyway, of cars and petals. And that's a common data set that's used to show examples in R. And I just couldn't get my head around that. But if it's healthcare, I can suddenly see it for some reason. So that's my lacking, but hopefully that's something that would help you as well. So these are summaries of blogs that come out, our weekly.org, our bloggers. So they do a summary of it. There are also um, Twitter is a big place. People do throw out questions to the general public on our stats, hashtag our stats, which um, gets various things on there. And again, it's very friendly, but it's the wider community. This is the world you're tweeting on. Hadley Wickham, this, when this was taken, he was a blue tick and now he's a white tick. He gets, he's got lots of followers. And uh, what wasn't on this course because it's happened is that since is the Stack Overflow, not Stack Overflow, getting all mixed up, was the, um, just looking for it, sorry. I have pasted a link to the Slack in the, um, the chat. Um, so you've muted yourself. We've missed like the last two minutes. Oh, don't worry. I wasn't saying anything really of any great value. can't get my screen to work on there. So you should be able to get onto the Slack group with dot, um, at nhs.net. I think some NHS emails accept it. Uh, the problem with Slack is we have to stipulate the endings and because we've got various organisations, you may not get in directly, but we'll, there is a, a link. Is that the share link that you've put, Dom, that people can just go in directly? Is that right? It's an invite link. I'm not quite yes. sure what it's a show link. So you should be able to go on with any email address with that invitation link. So even in private addresses. So okay. there are people on there with um, all sorts of backgrounds and abilities. We've got channels for a book club and uh, we're doing art of statistics. So it's not even about R necessarily, although it is available in R. Uh, we've also got a Python group as well. So it's, it's a nice place to go and ask questions generally of things of of issues. So I'm just going to go back now. Would it, people like a break? Because it's like lunchtime, getting a bit hungry. Any questions, actually? Let's do questions. I was going to say, can we have a break? Yes, can we have a break? Okay. 10 minutes or 15 minutes, a bit longer this time, 10 minutes. Uh, so 15 would work for me just to grab a quick sandwich. 15 would be better. Okay. So it's 22, yeah, 215, 22, I'm just trying to work it out now. I'm trying to do it on a clock, 14, so forget. Just call it one o'clock, it's easier. Yes, yeah, so I was <laughs> going to say just one o'clock. Should we just say one o'clock? Yes, cool. That sounds good. Okay, cool. I'll see you in a bit then. Dom. Are you still there? Have you run off? I can't see a thing. I am still here, but... Um, From the chat, do you think we need to cover anything in particular? So I've got um, some time to cover things. Everyone else is still here, possibly as well. But just... 